Hello, true crime bookworms. Thank you for diving back into the abyss with us. My name is Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And today we will be talking about the book Find Her by Lisa Gardner. We are very excited to talk to you about this. Brittany loved this book, so she recommended that we read it. I really enjoyed the book. I did it audio style this time, which is a little bit different for me. Switching it up. I think I probably would have preferred to read it, (laughs) but it was still an amazing book and it kept me hooked the entire time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, do all of that fun stuff. Make sure to shoot us a message on your opinions about the book. We'd love to hear your insight. We have a Patreon now, so if you would like to donate some money to the podcast to keep us up and going, we would really appreciate it. Go on our website, theabysspod.com, to learn a little bit more about what that entails. And without further ado, let's dive into the abyss. We're going to start off by reading you the summary for Find Her just to kind of refresh your memory if you maybe finished the book a while back about what it all encompassed or maybe if you're joining us for the true crime stuff that we talk about later and just didn't read the book and don't really know what the book was about. The summary off Amazon was, quote, Seven years ago, carefree college student Flora Dane was kidnapped while on spring break. For 472 days, Flora learned just how much one person can endure. Miraculously alive after her ordeal, Flora has spent the past five years reacquainting herself with the rhythms of normal life, working with her FBI victim advocate, Samuel Keynes. She has a mother who's never stopped loving her, a brother who is scared of the person she's become, and a bedroom wall covered with photos of other girls who have never made it home. When Boston detective Dee Dee Warren is called to the scene of the crime, a dead man and the bound, naked woman who killed him, she learns that Flora has tangled with three other suspects since her return to society. Is Flora a victim or a vigilante? And with her first-hand knowledge of criminal behavior, could she hold the key to rescuing a missing college student whose abduction has rocked Boston? When Flora herself disappears, Dee Dee realizes a far more sinister predator is out there, one who's determined that this time Flora Dane will never escape. And now it is all up to Dee Dee Warren to find her. End quote. So Lisa Gardner has written many, many, many books. She's written a lot of thrillers, psychological and crime novels. And she also writes romance novels under a different name. So she's definitely a well-worn writer. She must be just writing all the time. (laughs) Whipping out those pages. (laughs) Her work has been converted into films and has appeared on True TV and CNN. She even looks like an old school reporter that you would see from like the 60s or 70s or maybe in like Stranger Things. (laughs) And this book, Find Her, is actually sort of in the middle of a very large series of hers that follows the character Dee Dee Warren. But this is the first one that introduces Flora Dane as a character. So even though it's sort of in the middle, it kind of starts its own little like sub series, I guess. So there's more books that have to do with Flora and the other characters in the book. And there's also several, quite a few, I think, books that happen before it. So if you want to kind of gain a little bit more context in some of that, you can read the whole series. But this book was great standalone, too. There really wasn't any situation where you're in the dark because you hadn't read a previous book or anything like that. To kind of start off our thoughts on the book, just... Starting off with a round of applause for Lisa Gardner. This novel did an amazing job at raising awareness about the impact that survivors have to endure in their personal lives after a traumatic experience and how the incident can impact their families as well forever. There is no going back to normal after a traumatic event like this. There's only a new normal. And so she did a really good job of grasping that and presenting that to the reader. I agree. I feel like a lot of these books kind of, they have these events build up and then sort of the climax and then it falls off. But then it's like, oh, and things went back to normal and I just went back to life. But I think this one, it balances the crime and the story and the mystery of it with the emotional side of what victims go through and that whole situation, not just like, oh, something happened and now everything's fine. So definitely, I agree that it was really well written in that way. This book talked a lot about abduction and dealing with confined spaces. 
Starting off the novel with being trapped in a dark box was an amazing hook. And I had told Brittany that I was like starting the audiobook while I was going for a walk. And I was like, I can't listen to this on a walk. I'm not going to be able to focus. This is insane. And so I ended up having to stop the book and restart it because I wanted to be able to sit down and just like really listen to what was going on. Lisa Gardner did a really good job with all the little details that built up this first scene. It was like going through all five senses for describing what Flora was going through. And you really got this visceral image of where she was. And you could completely picture not just the setting, but the feelings and the entire situation as a whole. This book also brought up a lot of similar cases that are real life stories like J.C. Dugard, Elizabeth Smart, and Patty Hearst, who we've talked about in a previous episode. Um, So that kind of also made that connection from fact to fiction where you feel like that this really did kind of happen in a real setting and it's connected to very real huge cases. So that was super interesting as well. I personally really like the kind of femme fatale vigilante stories. I think that they are very satisfying, I guess, kind of, even though that sounds kind of bad. But I feel like the sort of revenge and the survivor and the going the extra mile to save other people, that kind of thing. I really like those stories a lot. I do too. This kind of reminds me of that movie that just came out. I can't remember what it's called, but like the girl goes to bars and picks up these guys and then kills them because they were being a little sleazy, I guess. So it kind of reminds me of like that kind of thing, you know, the vigilante behaviors. I liked in the book how there was continual twists and turns throughout the entirety of the book and suspense was always building. I'm pretty good at guessing the ending or an outcome and the way that the detectives were going with the case really made you feel like, oh, well, this this would be a great place for it to do it. Of course, it's here, you know, but it wouldn't be. You'd think, you know, who's about to abduct her and then you're wrong. You think, you know, who the killer is and then you're wrong again. You think, you know, who you think, you know, where she was taken, but you're wrong yet again. And my detective skills were way off during this book. And I slightly blame it on the fact it was an audio book, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> brush it off like that. But no, in all honesty, she did such a good job. Yeah, there were lots and lots of twists in this. And even that first part where she was at the club and had that confrontation and you're like, oh, this is like the build up to the main story. But it was like, nope, that was just (laughs) kind of her life. Yeah, it was like psych. And actually, it isn't even the guy who you thought was going to kidnap her. (laughs) It was the bartender. You know, it's like crazy. But then it, it does end up kind of wrapping together at the end. So even that you're like, oh, that's a big part and then you're like oh no it's not a big part and then you're like oh it actually (laughs) fits back into it so that was cool writing and that shows a very skilled writer to be able to weave that all together and not make it feel choppy or make it too obvious I hate in suspense books when they just treat you like you're an idiot and have to spell everything out for you that just takes away all the suspense and you're like okay well I know what's gonna happen or even when they try to make it super super obvious and then do one twist on you but I feel like with this book it was like she gave you enough to show that maybe this is a main point now and then later it comes back but it's not the overarching main plot so I think she weaved that all together really 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 well it felt like it was written in a way that respects the reader's intelligence rather than just leading them one way or another and making every twist this huge obvious thing I also love a good story with different perspectives. We talked about that when we did The Whisper Man, and it's just so good to hear an author who can capture multiple different personalities and individuals. So she did a really good job of capturing the detective and intertwining it with Flora's story, but having different personalities and different circumstances. Yeah, I really enjoyed that too. I really liked that both of the main viewpoints of the story were strong female perspectives And I thought that was pretty refreshing to have so many strong female characters. I feel like in a lot of times, it's either, even if there are a lot of female characters, they're kind of on the weaker side. But in this, there were two strong people kind of coming together and they would clash and it didn't always work out. 
I think that was one of the problems I had with all the missing girls is the characters just seemed kind of flat. But I think with this, they were very in-depth and there was a lot of dimension to the characters. So I enjoyed that too. As we said before, Lisa Gardner did a really amazing job at opening the mind of the victim for the reader. And she offered that perspective of the emotions and the turmoil that goes on with victims. It was super intense. And I really liked the parts where she would ask herself questions to calm down. Like, am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Am I in pain, hot, cold? And as someone that has pretty intense anxiety, I've honestly used that since reading this book in my life. And it's pretty helpful to kind of ground you and calm you down. You can kind of see like, I'm not in immediate danger. I'm not in immediate pain. I don't need food or water. Like I'm fine. And I thought that was really a cool thing that she had as a reoccurring theme in the book. And that's helped me. So that kind of made me think that Lisa Gardner understands the anxiety perspective, which is refreshing. I think a lot of times in books, especially crime books, Mental illness is just sensationalized, stereotypes or fetishized, and it's seen more as this like intense character flaw that needs to be overcome rather than it's just a part of the situation that someone has to deal with. So I liked that the characters were still really strong, but then showed vulnerability and she still dealt with PTSD and mental health issues and had to overcome that to get to safety. And it wasn't just sort of a thing to be cured. It was something that she had to harness and that was part of her character development. So I loved that about this book. I didn't even notice that, but now that you mention it, I really I really like that too because you think a lot of times it's like at the end of the book it's like, oh, I was anxious and now I'm not, you know, and that's not the way real life works. And I think it's important to you and people like you who read this book and see that like it's not about getting rid of it it's about harnessing it and taking control of it so it doesn't take control of you and I I really loved that about this book and I think I will take that a little bit into the rest of my life and be helped out by that so that's kind of cool <laughs> go Lisa Gardner <laughs> <laughs> this book had some really strong female leads like we mentioned it was filled with a bunch of fighters you had DD You had Detective Dee Dee, you had Flora, you had Rose, her mother, who was fighting for her daughter. So many strong women in this book that really took the lead and led this book in a strong way. I liked that the characters had kind of different kinds of strength. Like Detective Dee Dee Warren was very focused on her job and very concerned with getting justice. And she was very kind of clinical about it and always like pushed forward sort of in a skeptical way of the emotional side of things. And Flora was similar in, for a lot of the book, she tried to kind of push aside these traumatic emotions and stuff, but she was this huge fighter. And her mother was also a fighter, but she was more of kind of a soft and compassionate and loving kind of strength. So I liked that it sort of offered three types of strength that are kind of similar, but also offered in different ways with the characters. And I also liked that all three of them were kind of stubborn in their own way. So they kind of clashed over that. And it was like when people are too similar and they kind of butt heads over it. But at the same time, it all fit together where they all helped each other and all work together to overcome these things. I also love that the book started off with her being in the bar and feeling so confident and that Flora seemed to have it all down pat. But once you really got to know her character, she had crumbled before she had felt weaker. We all think that we would be so strong and fight back in situations like this, but we really can't say unless we have been in that situation, which thankfully I never have and I hope to never be. But then it comes around in the end when she's about to give up. And I got goosebumps when she said, I am not hungry. I am not tired. I am not cold or in pain. I am going to do what I do best. I'm going to survive. I was like, yes, you're about to slay. Get it. Open up a can of whoop ass and do it. You know, like you could just feel her power and her strength. And like she was going to get out of there and she was going to fight. And I think that's another cool correlation to real life that I think a lot of times people that go through traumas or just hard situations, one of the first things that a lot of people say to them is, oh, you're so strong. Like, oh, you're so strong for not, you know, breaking down or not having emotions about this and stuff. But when you really think about it, the emotions bring strength. And even 
having breakdowns sometimes or having intense emotions about it, it doesn't mean that you're weak or that you failed or that you're not getting past it. It's just part of dealing with trauma. And it's important to understand that it's not weakness and it's not a lack of strength to show emotion and to feel vulnerable and to express those feelings with other people. But at the same time, when it counts, Flora in this case really harnessed it and pushed forward when she could have just given up. So that's the strength, not that she didn't have emotion or didn't express it, but that she did what she needed to do to survive. In regards to the ending, am I the only one who absolutely loved it? When Flora was spilling out her emotions to her mother about how she had truly felt the entire time, no matter how guilty it made her feel to say it, she still felt like she needed to get it off her chest. If you don't recall, you should go back and listen or read that part of the book. Her mom just comforted her and gave her really good advice and told her that nothing was her fault. I thought that was beautifully done. As human beings, we tend to blame ourselves for a lot of things that happen or feel the need to apologize for our emotions, attempting to feel stronger. However, we see that opening up and showing our weaknesses is the true sign of strength. I really loved the ending of that book and it just proved how strong of a character Flora really was. It was very beautifully done. I wholeheartedly agree. The ending was so good and it really made me want to read more of the series and follow along with Flora more and see more of her development as a character. And like I've said, not just the crime side of it, but the emotions and the strength that came with that and the way that Lisa Gardner captured all of that was really, really good. Overall, I rate this 10 out of 10. I can't really think of anything I would change about it. I think it was really good and captured a lot of things that you don't see a lot in crime fiction. And I very much appreciated that. And I definitely want to read the rest of the series. Yeah, I would say mine was probably like a 9 out of 10. It was an amazing book. And the only reason it's not like a 10 out of 10 for me is the stylistic side of it. I'm not very big on like monologues and it was very monologue heavy. I think it was really important for the book's sake to be monologue heavy because I think it really got you feeling what they were feeling in the moment with them as things were going on. But those just aren't really my favorite styles of books. I think it really worked well here and it kept me hooked throughout it. And the story was phenomenal, as was the writing. I just think that if I hadn't done the audiobook, I probably would have felt like I was just reading a droning on and on at some points. But I think the audiobook in this case probably really helped me to listen to the monologue a bit easier. But overall, I think Lisa did such an amazing job. So now we're going to get into the true crime related aspects of it. My first thought when even hearing about this book, my mom told me about it, was the case of Colleen Stan because of the wooden box aspect of it. In 1977, Colleen was 22 years old and she was hitchhiking to a birthday party. This was the 70s, so hitchhiking was pretty commonplace and Colleen had done it quite a bit. She considered herself pretty savvy with it and even turned down multiple rides she just didn't feel safe with on this particular day. Eventually, a blue van pulled up with a young family inside. The husband's name was Cameron Hooker and his wife was Janice and they had a baby. They were headed home and Colleen got in the car thinking nothing of it. She thought it was safe because they were a young family. There was a woman, there was a baby. So she really didn't get any red flags initially. They stopped for gas and Colleen went to the bathroom and she later said that at this point her gut instinct kicked in and told her just to run But she quelled her fears. She said, you know, oh, you're being ridiculous. Just get in the car and get where you're going. But unfortunately, her gut instinct was correct in this case. The car drove on till they reached a secluded area, at which point Colleen suddenly had a knife to her throat. She was forced into a box that didn't allow light or sound or much air into it and kept there. Unbeknownst to Colleen, Cameron and Janice had struck a deal that Cameron was allowed to kidnap a sex slave as long as there was no penetrative sex. Colleen endured the most horrific abuse. The first night she was held, she was strung up by her hands and beaten and left hanging there blindfolded. She was kept in this wooden box for 23 hours a day. She was also forced to sign a quote unquote contract, signing herself off as a slave. And she was physically and sexually and mentally tortured. After a while, the family moved and Colleen was kept in 
this wooden box under the couple's waterbed. Colleen was eventually allowed a little bit more freedom. She was allowed outside and to help with housework and gardening and things like that. But Cameron told her that he was part of this organization called The Company and that if she didn't follow these commandments that he set out that she would be severely punished and she was anytime she did anything he didn't like he would beat her severely and eventually she just tried her best to follow these commandments and stay in line basically she was even forced to help cameron create a dungeon for more sex slaves so that kind of correlates to the book when flora was forced to help them kidnap other women Interestingly enough, with this case, Colleen was allowed to visit her family in 1981, and she didn't say anything to them because she was so fearful of the company and Cameron, what he would do to her and her family. Cameron was there posing as her boyfriend, and her family just thought that she was kind of part of some strange cult because they hadn't heard from her. She looked disheveled and didn't have any money, so they just thought that but they didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to push her away more they thought if they called her out on it that she would just leave and never come back so they tried to be supportive unfortunately for both parties it didn't work out well and Colleen just stayed the course stayed silent and Cameron ended up becoming super fearful that he had messed up by letting Colleen see her family maybe he thought that she had communicated with them somehow or that now that they knew she was out there that they would be looking for her more so he locked her up in the box once again for 23 hours a day for the next three years the hookers had two children at this point and they knew colleen but were told that she had gone home during this time that she was trapped in the box and every night after the kids went to bed that's when they would take colleen out and torture her she was punished if she made noise and she had a lot of trouble breathing because air didn't get into the box very well. So she really had a horrific time for a really long period. She had to use a bedpan that she had to learn how to basically position herself on in this box. And she survived on tiny scraps of food. In 1983, Colleen was once again allowed out of the box and she was even allowed to get a job as a maid to make money for the family. And around this time, Cameron told Janice that he intended to take Colleen as his second wife. This was the last straw for Janice. She had put up with a lot and somehow this was the last thing that she just couldn't deal with. So Janice had some weird standards. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So Janice ended up talking to Colleen and she told her this organization, the company was real, but that Cameron was not a part of it. So she had been lied to this whole time. Colleen then simply took a bus and left. She called Cameron and told him that she was leaving and apparently he was crying on the phone, begging her to stay. And she just walked out because she was no longer under the fear that this organization was going to come after her or kill her and her family or anything like that. She didn't go to the police initially because she and Janice were trying to give Cameron a chance to become reformed. So that's probably just trauma bonding on both their parts, honestly, and not wanting to deal with everything that comes with sharing her story. But it's just wild what she had to endure and then just to not go to the police. Ultimately, Janice is the one that turned Cameron in for the things he had done to Colleen. And she also told them that Cameron had a previous victim, Marie Elizabeth Spanik, but her body was never found. Janice had allegedly been a victim herself. She claimed that from the first date, she had been abused, brainwashed, tortured, and forced to participate in all this stuff. Janice received full immunity in exchange for her testimony against Cameron, and he was sentenced to 104 years for what he did to Colleen, but no charges were brought on the murder of Marie because they couldn't find her body. In 2015, he was denied parole, and his next shot is in 2030, so... Here's hoping that he doesn't get out then. Colleen had a very, very hard time after this ordeal. She tried to get a degree in accounting. She had a few marriages that didn't work out. She had a daughter who ended up in kind of a bad path. A lot of this trauma has stuck with her throughout her life. I think Colleen's just trying to move on, but that's really hard. The psychological damage that comes from being confined for years, controlled, brainwashed, all of that. So that kind of correlates with the story too, with how much trouble that she had moving on from this. You can see how that's such a real life situation with trauma that severe. 
So it connects in a lot of ways, not just the box, even though that was the one that kind of connected it in my head because I had heard the story previously. And definitely that image of the wooden box came up with this. There are several documentaries and books about this story if you want to learn more about it. There's one called The Perfect Victim by Christine McGuire that was really good about it. So if you want to learn more about her story and all of that, then definitely check that out. Another theme from the book that we could relate to a true crime event, multiple true crime events actually doing some research, were truck drivers who were kidnappers or murderers. The case we're going to bring up to you today is is about Timothy J. Vafides. I don't know if I said that right, but I'll just call him Timothy for the rest of this. He was 56 years old and he was a truck driver in Minnesota. He started kidnapping young women and keeping them in a torture area of his truck that he used. And then he used them as sex slaves. He referred to this as the quote unquote Twilight Express. He was very big on vampires and he would even wear fake fangs. This led him to start chipping his victim's teeth to resemble fangs. At one point, he had a 19-year-old woman who happened to be a relative of his. She had bruises all over her, was noticed during an inspection of his truck. The girl had filed a restraining order against Timothy and he had had her for six months at this time. She volunteered to go work with him and then he had attacked her when she tried to leave and made her one of his sex slaves. During court proceedings, one woman said she got into his truck to head to dinner and became concerned when they saw they weren't going towards any of the restaurants. Timothy was quoted on CBS Sacramento telling the woman, quote, I got you now, you are mine, end quote. He controlled everything she did, even how she was using the bathroom. So he really just was a person who loved control. We see that a lot with perpetrators that they want to get people in a situation where they control them. That's why we always say never go to a second location because that's exactly what they want. He abused six women over 20 years and in 2016 he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He pled guilty to two counts of transporting for illegal sexual activity and this in turn dropped his two kidnapping charges. I feel like this is not a fair trade-off. I feel like he should have so much more than 20 years. Even though he has a short time, victims still have closure and taking it to trial would have gotten him a maximum of 25 years anyway. So I guess they decided just to settle for the 20. Another theme in the book was trauma bonding and sort of the loss of identity with captivity. And we've talked about J.C. Lee Dugard's case before in the Butterfly Garden episode, so I won't go over everything again. And definitely, I highly, highly, highly recommend if you want to learn more about her story, you read her books. They are incredible. And just seeing what she went through, that's so intense and heartbreaking. So if you want to learn the full story, I definitely recommend hearing it from her own words. As a kind of brief overview, JC was kidnapped at age 11 in 1991 by a man named Philip Garrido. Garrido was a convicted sex offender and was on parole. Like the hookers, Garrido's wife was aware that he kidnapped JC to use her as a sex slave. So there again, I don't know what these women are doing, honestly. JC was abused, degraded, and raped and brainwashed. She was told her parents didn't want her and that she was helping save other girls so Garrido didn't hurt them. And she pretty much accepted this after a while, that this was just her lot in life, that she was helping other girls so he wouldn't go after them. Eventually, she gave birth to two daughters um, while being chained up in the shed outside in his backyard. The main connection to this story is the reluctance that some long-term kidnapped victims have to being found or rescued. Garrido took JC and her daughters to the FBI to show them some crazy ideas about crime and religion and how he had been reformed and how he could reform other criminals and things like that. JC had been so conditioned with her new identity, it had been 18 years at this point, that she really didn't want to reveal who she was. She told agents that Garrido was a good person, that he was good with her kids. She said that she was a battered wife that was on the run and he was helping her. And when they pushed because they knew something wasn't right, She became super upset and agitated. She didn't want to tell them. She asked why she was being interrogated and all this stuff. So she was really attached to that identity that Garrido had forced on her. She told a bunch of different stories before finally writing her name on a piece of paper and 
passing it along to them. So that's sort of how it all unraveled. But initially, she just was very connected to that and very connected to Garrido. He was basically the strongest human connection she had had in her life. So that's a hard thing to let go of, even though a lot of people would think once you get that sort of taste of freedom, you just run or whatever. But psychology is hard to overcome in those situations. And for kidnap victims and even abuse people in general, being agreeable to their captors or abusers is literally a matter of surviving. So that becomes ingrained in as a habit just to be able to survive. Things like that can happen over a relatively short period of time, but definitely over 18 years or even one year or a matter of months, it can definitely happen. It literally changes the chemistry of your brain. So it's not just a matter of snapping back into your old life. Like like we said before, there's no going back to normal. It's a new normal. So you just have to sort of take that and do the best you can with it and understand that different people respond to it differently. Another topic from the book Find Her was students going missing on spring break. That happens a lot in reality because you have a bunch of people who are in high school or in college and they're going away from their comfortability of home and they're traveling to some beach places. They're usually intoxicated. They're having a good time. They're letting their guards down. So a lot of people do go missing on spring break trips. The one we're going to discuss today is Brittany Drexel. She was 17 years old and she was a high schooler from Rochester, New York. In 2009, Brittany asked her mom if she could go on this trip with three friends to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for spring break. Her mom said no because she didn't really know the friends that were going. Myrtle Beach was pretty far away. She just didn't really feel comfortable with the situation. But she told Brittany that she could go to Charlotte Beach, which was a lot closer to home. Brittany agreed, but she really lied. And instead of Charlotte Beach, she went to Myrtle Beach anyway. While in Myrtle Beach, Brittany ran into a man she knew from Rochester named Peter Brozowitz, who was a 20-year-old club promoter. She went to his hotel for a while and then proceeded to return to her room around 9 p.m. She was seen on the hotel security footage leaving, so it's confirmed that she was no longer at the hotel with Peter. On the walk back, she was texting her boyfriend and then suddenly stopped. Phone calls started going to voicemail, and her phone then pinged twice between 9.30 and midnight, once in Myrtle Beach and another about an hour south. Her phone was never found. It pinged in an area where there were many gators and large water masses. The friends who were with Brittany didn't search for her or even contact the family or authorities when she went missing. All of her belongings were still in the hotel except for her purse and her cell phone, which she had with her at the time. Once they found out that she was missing, some stayed to search for a day and then they ended up leaving back to New York. Her boyfriend became really concerned that she wasn't responding, so he had a friend who was located at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina drive down to Myrtle Beach and file a missing persons report. It was discovered that Brozowitz checked out of his hotel that night at about 1 to 2 a.m. and returned to Rochester, leaving behind all of the friends that were with him. Yeah, that's a little suspicious. (laughs) Many people, including Brittany's mother, thinks that she may have been a victim of human trafficking, Some people came forward with tips, but they really went nowhere, and this case has gone cold. In 2016, a special agent in charge of the FBI in South Carolina, his name was David Thomas, and he came forward and said that they had concluded that Britt was no longer alive. Court records later showed that an informant who was an inmate named Taquan Brown had told law enforcement that Brittany was kidnapped, gang raped, shot to death, and then fed to the alligators. This is really specific the fbi agent said that they had multiple statements of her being fed to the gators or her body being thrown in a pit but no body has been found brown even said that he went to a stash house and saw Britt being sexually abused and pistol whipped and when she tried to escape he heard two gunshots and just assumed that she was killed so this is like really specific And when you hear something specific like that, it automatically draws suspicion onto how accurate it is. Investigators have a person of interest named Timothy Deshaun Taylor. He failed a polygraph when asked about Brittany and police believe that he has some very pertinent information to the case. Taquan Brown initially came forward and said that Taylor had been 
one of the people sexually abusing Brittany. And later, Taquan Brown, their informant, ended up filing a lawsuit because he was getting a lot of death threats and assaulted because of the statements that he had made about Brittany Drexel's case. So it's very interesting. They don't know what happened to Brittany. They don't know where she is to this day. And all they can go off of is this man's statement and the evidence they have of where her phone pinged. So it's hard to really know what happened, but this relates a lot to find her with the girl who was kidnapped on spring break and the family was searching for her, trying to find her. It's just something that I think a lot of people aren't aware of that it's a very dangerous situation sometimes. Another thing from the book that we wanted to talk about was kidnappers slash killers taunting the family or contacting the family in some way. One example of this is the Long Island serial killer. This person killed prostitutes found on Craigslist from 1996 up to possibly 2013. He was never caught, so it's hard to tell exactly if all of the victims were from one person. Some people think it was multiple killers dumping in the same place in Suffolk County and Jones Beach State Park. Police stumbled on the first body during training and a subsequent search found three more bodies and a few months later, four more bodies were found. And in December of 2011, the remains of Shannon Gilbert were found, but police said her death was an accident. Her family really disagrees with this and I would have to agree. I think that the circumstances surrounding her disappearance were very alarming. She was last seen running out of someone's house in fear. And then the next time she was found was in this marshy area. And police thought that she just tripped and fell into the marsh and drowned. But she was obviously in fear for her life. I think writing it off as an accident is kind of strange, especially when her body was found in the same place as other sex workers that had been murdered. So there's a whole documentary that I've recently saw about her case in particular. So I highly recommend watching that if you want some more information on her case and kind of the weird twists there. Overall, I think she was really let down by the police. And I think it's a mistake to just write her off at this point. Suspects came and went. They had several major suspects, but none of them really panned out. And they had hundreds of tips pouring in, but the perpetrator still remained a mystery. We can't get into this entire case because there's just so much to it, but there's a lot of documentaries and podcasts and books and things like that that cover it. So definitely one of those things that you can dive into and get really deep in that abyss if you want to. Yeah, this is probably one of the most commonly known true crime incidents out there, like one that almost everybody you'll talk to has heard about it. So it's definitely got a ton of resources for you to find. And maybe in the future, we will do a full episode and give it kind of the justice it deserves. But for now, just sort of a brief overview. Ten bodies were found. They were the bodies of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, age 25, Melissa Bartholomew, age 24, Megan Waterman, age 22, Amberlyn Costello, age 27, Jessica Taylor, age 20, Valerie Mack, age 24. And then there were also two Jane Doe's and an unidentified toddler that was linked to one of the Jane Doe's as her mother. And there was also a John Doe and none of those have been identified yet. Several other possible victims have come up too. There's quite a few people that connect other bodies that were found in the area to this but without concrete physical evidence or a suspect or anything like that it's really hard to discern whether this is just a spree of people killing sex workers or if it's one person targeting them we've seen that quite a few times like one serial killer targeting sex workers in particular so i don't think that's in any way out of the realm of possibility like we said this was a case where the killer contacted the family of the victims and this isn't all that uncommon we saw this with zodiac and with several other serial killers but the long island serial killer in particular called the sister of melissa bartholomew and really traumatized her with that call and in shannon gilbert's case when they were investigating they came across a man named peter hackett who was one of the suspects that police considered with the serial killings and Hackett actually called Shannon Gilbert's mother twice over the course of her disappearance before her body was found and he later denied these calls 
But it was connected back to him through phone records. So I don't really know why he was even denying that or why he did it in the first place. But that really upset Shannon's mother. And if you know a lot about this case, I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me that I think Peter Hackett is a pretty solid suspect for this. He's a little shady. (laughs) Yeah, my money is definitely on Peter Hackett for being the Long Island serial killer or at the very, very least killing Shannon Gilbert. So I really hope that they investigate more on that case. And I hope that Shannon and the rest of the victims have justice at some point. Another case where the perpetrator contacted the family was the case with Larry Jean Bell. He lived in Lexington County, South Carolina, and he married a woman. They had a son. He ended up joining the Marines, but he was shortly discharged afterwards for shooting himself in the knee while he was cleaning a gun. He ended up getting a divorce, and after that, he really spiraled into this bad mental state. He abducted Sharon Smith, who was 17 years old, at gunpoint from her driveway. And he killed her shortly after the abduction. And he called the family to taunt them about this multiple times, eventually giving them directions to her body. When he was taunting her, he would even describe how he killed her and also tell them that she was okay sometimes. So he kind of made them second guess what was going on, what was happening, until ultimately just directing them to where her body was. He did this again with a nine-year-old named Deborah Helmick. And he called her family as well and gave them directions to Deborah's body. So it has to be pretty traumatic to get these directions and know that you're not going to have a pleasant outcome. Either she's going to be alive and this is going to be like a shootout or she's going to be dead. And so Larry Jean Bell really liked to taunt the families and make them feel vulnerable and useless to what he had done or what he was doing to these girls. So that kind of wraps up the true crime connections and our views on the book. We really hope that you enjoyed it and we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You can comment on our YouTube video for this or on our website. You can send us a message, comment on Facebook, just pretty much any way you want to get in contact. We'd love to hear what you thought of it. And now we're going to reveal the book for next month. We are going to be reading The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn, and that episode will come out on October 2nd, 2020. The synopsis is, quote, it isn't paranoia if it's really happening. Anna Fox lives alone, a recluse in her New York City home, unable to venture outside. She spends her days drinking wine, maybe too much, watching old movies and recalling happier times and spying on her neighbors. The Russells move into the house across the way, a father, a mother, and their teenage son, the perfect family. But when Anna, gazing out her window one night, sees something she shouldn't, her world begins to crumble, and its shocking secrets are laid bare. What is real? What is imagined? Who is in danger? Who is in control? In this diabolically gripping thriller, no one and nothing is what it seems. End quote. So definitely check that out. You can go to our website and we will have a link to purchase the book on our show notes for the Find Her episode, and you can get started reading that. I know the movie was set to come out in May, I think, and they've pushed it off quite a bit, so um, we'll see. (laughs) Hopefully, we can beat them to the punch. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you so much for joining us again, and... Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode and we'll see you next time. Thanks for jumping into the abyss with us. Bye.